interest rates are so low, I, I need income, I can't find any income, what am I going to do? You know, this is a common refrain that a lot of investors are really struggling with right now because interest rates truly are low. And they're so low that you really can't get any income from bonds. So the traditional use of bonds has really become more problematic than it has in the 50 years that I've been managing money. But, you know, I had a subscriber request. This is my Tuesday subscriber request video. I'm Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, also known by many of you as Mr. Valuation. And I had a subscriber, and pardon me for reading, Mr. N International four days ago said, what do you think about low volatility stocks as bond substitutes like Kellogg's or General Mills? Food stocks are low volatility. Do you like them? Okay, very interesting question. And it also brings up a, a little bit of a soapbox point of mine, if you will, before I actually get into talking about the request that Mr. International asked. I get so many requests from you subscribers, and I really enjoy doing this type of video because it gives me a chance to connect with you. It gives me a chance to focus on things that are on your minds as valued subscribers to the YouTube channel here. And by the way, if you're not a subscriber already, please go ahead and click the subscribe button. And if you like the work as after I'm going through this video, give me a like and ring the bell and do all those good things as well. But regardless, you know, it's, um, it's very important to me. Now I get hundreds of requests to cover individual stocks. Unfortunately, there's no way for me to do all of those. But what I do try to do, and again, I apologize for those of you that feel slighted when your request doesn't get covered, I try to do a subscriber request video where I can really make a, what I consider to be an, an important investment principle or point that can help you just be better overall general investors. And this question about bond substitutes that Mr. Ant International asked, I think, is really one of those types of requests that are interesting. Now, I'm going to go ahead and get into these two companies here and talk about them. But I also want to talk about some other points here. This idea that they're low volatile stocks is, you know, a, the question is, is it perception or is it reality? And I think these are important things. A lot of investors carry ideas, notions, perceptions whatsoever that in reality turn out not to really hold up under closer scrutiny. One of the real advantages about the Fast Graphs Fundamentals Analyzer software tool that I co-founded and developed is that, that we call it a tool to think with. It, first of all, allows you to analyze certain dogmas and certain positions like, you know, food stocks or, or, or these are actually packaged food stocks are low volatile stocks. So the question is, are they really? I'm going to get into that within this video. But the other side is, is there such a thing as a bond substitute? Should you be thinking of stocks ever as bond substitutes? That's a controversial discussion and controversial subject. And, and a lot of it, again, comes to do with perspective versus reality. Some people just consider stocks risky, and they think all stocks are risky, and they tend to think in gener generalities. And I'm always pointing out that it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. And, and, and within the context of that, I'm also trying to point out that there are different, you know, courses for different people, different horses for different people. You know, some stocks are growth stocks, and they give you the opportunity to make huge capital gains. Some stocks are very stable income stocks. Some stocks are very safe blue chip stocks. Some stocks are relatively low, vol you know, low volatility and low growth. And, and some have high dividend income. Some have low dividend income. Some grow their dividends fast. Some grow their dividends slow. Stocks are almost as unique as individuals. So I never like to think in these generalities. But let's talk about whether we could ever use a stock as a bond substitute or not. So the two stocks that were mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and turn our attention now to start with Kellogg's. And what I've done here, I've purposely left stock prices off of here because the discussion is going to be on whether or not these are low volatile stocks or not. But what I want you to focus on first is the characteristics of the business behind the stock. To me, that's always the critical question and the critical thing that we want to look at. So as I examine Kellogg here, and I'm really going back to 2001, the company did pay a dividend prior to this, but I'm really starting right here where the company had, had, first of all, a couple things about the dividend. They had a dollar one dividend in 2001 and then in 2002, 2003, 2004. So there was no dividend growth for those four years. And you could see kind of a flattening of the white line here, the dividend line. 
Then their dividend went, they did raise it to 106, to 114, to 120, went right through the Great Recession, raising their dividend every year, and have continued to do that since all the way back to 2004. Okay, so they've had, I think it's 18 consecutive years of increasing their dividend. Now, let's talk about some of the characteristics of Kellogg's. Number one is the growth is 4.4%. One thing about valuation, there are factors like growth that's always associated with, with determining what a good valuation is. Low growth stocks tend to be more, I think you have to be more careful that you really pay a good valuation before, you know, to invest in them because you don't get a lot of growth to bail you out. With faster growing stocks, you know, like growth stocks, stocks like Facebook and, and even Amazon, which grows cash flows at, you know, unbelievably fast rates, you know, you can make valuation mistakes with them because their future growth or high growth rates will bail you out. But with lower growth stocks like Kellogg's and General Mills, which I'll go ahead and show you now, it was, it was a 6% grower and Kellogg's being a 4% grower. These are, you know, below average to slightly average growing stocks. Now, there's a couple of things that are interesting about these stocks from the point of view, are they truly bond substitutes? Well, number one is they produce a 3.66% dividend yield if you're looking at Kellogg and 3.48% if you're looking at General Mills. Now, when you look at that relative to the level of interest rates today and recognize that, you know, as of August 31st, the 10-year Treasury note was 1.63%, which is kind of a benchmark, if you will, you know, these stocks with 3.5% approximate yields are attractive income vehicles. It's very, very hard, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, to find anything that gives you any d dividend income. But the current yield alone is often not enough. One of the things I like about dividend growth stocks is the idea that we get what is called growth yield. I call growth yield. Most people call yield on cost. And so if I look at General Mills here first and look at their long-term performance, I do want you to note a couple of things. Number one is they ended up with a 4.8% capital appreciation. That's the stock price going from $22.28 on December 29th, 2000 to $58.63 by September 13th, yesterday's closing price, 2021. Okay, that's a 4.8% capital appreciation on a $10,000 investment. Would have turned into 26000 However, you can look at that as getting 16,000 of growth. To your 10,000 investment plus 16,000 would be the 26,000, but almost half of your total return, your total annualized return, which was $37,481 or 6.6%, came from the $11,167 worth of cumulative income, which was not quite, but more than two times what the S&P or the overall stock market would have generated. So this is clearly an income vehicle, but it's also a growth vehicle. The company has increased their dividend again. Once they started increasing it in 2003 to 2004, you can see that it went from a 2.5% yield to 2.8 to 3 to 3.2 and so on and so forth, all the way to last you know, fiscal year, they ended up paying a 9.1% yield on cost or growth yield. So your income was increasing and they did produce a lot of income. Okay, when I look at the performance of Kellogg's in the same context, I see slightly, you know, similar but different. I see the fact that there was no dividend growth in 2001, 2, and 3, and 4, and then they started growing the dividend. The average growth has been about 4%. By the way, that ties in pretty close to the 4% growth that the business actually generated. That's also important. Their capital appreciation was about 4%, which again ties in to the growth that the business achieved. And they, again, threw off almost 12000 in dividend income, came up with a very similar number but slightly different method of getting there. They threw off $12,500 in income and turned 10000 into 24000 instead of 26000 like we saw in General Mills. But these are comparable numbers from comparable companies, okay? So now let's bring monthly closing stock prices into the graph. This orange line on the fast graph represents a theoretical formulated 
intrinsic value based on a modified version of discounted cash flow analysis, okay? In other words, it's a P.E. ratio that generates an earnings yield, and in this case, it's a 15 P.E. ratio. So this orange line represents a P.E. ratio of 15 anywhere you touch it. That would be a 6.67% earnings yield. Okay, now Kellogg, as I want you to go through the numbers, has a 6.44% earnings yield, which tells me that the price will be just slightly above this orange line when I bring it on. The dividend yield of 3.66% is significantly higher than the market's current yield, which is around one and a quarter percent ish. I haven't checked here today, but it's I'm probably pretty close. So this is giving us a much higher current dividend yield. So let's go ahead and put monthly closing prices on the graph. And we see something very interesting here. Number one is we note that the price tends to be above the orange line most of the time in this example. And this is a blue chip, you know, staple. You know, it's only triple B rated, but it is, you know, the Kellogg cereals. We all know the company. So what's missing on the graph is another valuation reference. This would be intrinsic value. My argument is you have to be very, very disciplined and only invest in stocks like Kellogg's that grow at low rates of 4% like this when it's trading at or below the orange line. Those are optimum. Now, if you look at the orange line as a range, you would see that Kellogg would be very close here. Okay, it's only, as I mentioned earlier, slightly above the orange line. But the next valuation reference line is the normal multiple that the market applies. Big brands like Kellogg's tend to have premium valuations awarded them by the market over time. And, you know, in this case, we're looking at a normal P.E. ratio of 17.6. Now, that number will change as I change time frames. I want you to basically be aware of that there's the dynamic benefit of the fast graph research tool. And I call it a tool to think with. It allows you to analyze these things. But the key is it's a reference. So, you know, my top valuation I'd ever want to pay for this stock is a 17 P.E., all right, that's, you know, that would be, I would be buying it at the normal market value. But if I'm really a true hardcore value investor, as yours truly certainly is, I don't want to buy the stock unless it's trading, you know, on or and preferably below the orange line where I could even get a margin of safety. But Kellogg's is close here. Okay, so if you're willing to accept a 3.6% yield, you know, and looking at the future, the company's expected to grow at 3.2% over the next couple of years, all right? And this has a, a December fiscal year, all right? So what I'm looking at is a rate of return expectation going forward of maybe five or 6% total return, which includes capital appreciation, most of it coming from the dividend. So is it a bond substitute? It could be argued if you're willing to accept that, that yes, you know, because of the growth yield, the yield on cost increasing, and the fact that it has higher yield than a bond, those factors might overcome the quote unquote theoretical lack of safety that the business Kellogg's actually creates. But I don't want you to just automatically consider these stocks as Mr. International did in his comment as low volatility stocks. And let me explain. If I look at Kellogg's coming into the Great Recession, it was overvalued by my definition. But if I, you know, look out here, you know, from August of 2007 to March of 2009, and that was a 33% drop in value. From the bottom to the next peak, if you will, and I'm getting, I would always be real close with these numbers. That was a 50% increase in the value from March to April, just a little over a year. So as I just eyeball this stock price, there is volatility. There's times when the volatility is relatively low, but there's also spikes in that volatility. So don't automatically think that you're not going to face any volatility. When this thing got really crazy overvalued in July of 2016, it became, and I actually bought some Kellogg's at that point right there where, you know, we had this 36% drop in valuation and, you know, it was only a 29% loss if you threw in the dividend income. But the point is there was that kind of volatility in this stock. So at this point, there is volatility here like all stocks have. The fundamentals, the business, if I you know take price off the graph again and just look at the earnings growth, reasonably stable. Every now and then we have these down years, but they still tend to be very profitable years. I want to make that point. All right, now let's do the same exercise with General Mills. 
Once again, when I put price on the graph, I see this tendency, but not quite as strong as we saw with Kellogg, ironically, where the price tends to be significantly above the orange line. But here we get a chance to buy it when it's in alignment. Now, once again, I've got a 6.4% earnings yield. That means the price is just a little bit above the orange line. But once again, I would have very large periods. You know, I could have very high periods of volatility here in relatively short periods of time, you know, where the price could rise or fall. You know, here's 27% here. You know, it recovered again very quickly. And of course, the other message here is to note how the price tracks. Here's a 39% increase in a and again, from May of 2009 to January of 2010, that was a, you know, a substantial gain. Valuation matters, and it matters a lot. You can make a lot of money even on a low growth stock if you buy it at an attractive valuation. If you buy it at a relatively high valuation, you're going to get a rate of return that's very consistent with the amount of growth that the company actually achieves. That's one of the key attributes of valuation. But don't mistakenly believe that these are low volatile stocks. They tend to be lower volatility than a lot of stocks, but there's always going to be volatility when you're dealing with a stock because you're also dealing with an auction market. When again, when we look at performance, we see good dividend growth at about 7% here in this case versus the slower growth we saw in Kellogg because we've got a little faster growth going on in a business. When I say this is a tool to think with, these are the kinds of thoughts I want you to basically be evaluating. What has been the growth rate of the company? How consistently it has been? What has been its dividend record historically? You know, I believe these historical looks at these stocks are critically important because they tell you a lot about the nature of the beast, if you will. Now, I consider General Mills reasonably attractive in today's interest rate environment, I would consider this, again, another triple B-rated company. You know, Kellogg's is also a triple B-rated company. These companies are, are, you know, they've been around for long periods of time. They're not very fast growing. And the message that I want to bring into the equation here is when you're looking at stocks, again, different, you know, horses for different courses, as I tried to badly say earlier in this video. The point is there's a reason to invest in a company like Kellogg. But you should have what I would call realistic expectations. You're not going to make 10 times your money in owning a Kellogg or a General Mills. You're going to protect your money kind of like you do in a bond. You have an opportunity for some modest dividend growth. And if you buy them at attractive valuations, you can actually increase your rate of return to what I would call acceptable levels, 7 or 8% levels, and also generate significant income by doing that. Like I did here, if I'd have bought it at the throes of the recession, I would have done a lot better you know, buying the stock there than the company actually did. It only grew at 2.5% during this time frame, but I made 7.43%, including dividend income, because I bought it when it was low at a PE of 11.9, and today the PE is 15.5. So in addition to the growth of 2.47%, I also got modest PE ratio expansion, which let me make more than the 2.5% growth plus dividend income. I've got ended up with a 7% rate of return, but I also have a nice income vehicle over this time frame. You know, I generated more income than I would have got from the average stock. And remember, the market, as I've shown you in previous videos right now, the stock market itself is extremely overvalued, in my opinion. These stocks were overvalued, and they've corrected. They've come into fair value. And I think it's very important to always have that perspective when you're investing in stocks. Like I like to say, measuring performance without simultaneously measuring valuation is a job half done. Because when I look at the performance, even over the last 14 years of the Standard & Poor's, for example, I get you know 11% and I get $3,600 in dividend income, where if I'm looking at that same performance you know, over that same time frame with a company like General Mills, all right, I'm getting a 4.8%, now slightly different time frames here. And the reason for that is, is because I've got a May fiscal year, okay? I was doing 12-month fiscal year when I was doing the Standard & Poor's number. But the point is, I'm getting a different result here. I'm getting more dividend income, but I'm getting a much lower amount of capital appreciation and my total return is less. But if my need is for income, this makes more sense than investing in the S&P 500 
Plus, I've got the risk in the S&P 500 of this very high valuation. So, you know, the S&P grew at about 8%, 7.9 during this period of time coming out of the Great Recession. But we had enormous P.E. ratio expansion. The P.E. went from about just under 16 to the current blended P.E. of almost 25. So, you know, the key is, are these good bond substitutes? If you're willing to understand what they are and recognize the true nature of the beast, as I tried to explain in this video, I think you can think of them as good income alternative investments. You know, they don't have the safety of the bond. They don't guarantee your principal back. But the problem is bonds aren't necessarily that safe anymore because inflation is killing you in bonds where at least a stock like General Mills or Kellogg has the ability to give you some you know, income growth that could actually fight inflation, maybe at least keep up with it, and maybe even beat it in the long run. So yes, I like both of these stocks today for income. I think both of them are reasonably valued. I don't think they're cheap. I don't think there's a lot of margin of safety. But these certainly would be a lot better to buy Kellogg's today than it would have been back in July of 2016. And the same with General Mills. It makes a lot more sense to buy General Mills today than it did in June or July of 2016 when these stocks became irrationally exuberant. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, I enjoy bringing it to you. Again, this is my subscriber request series. It's a series that I'm very passionate about because I do get to connect and talk to you, my valued subscribers. Once again, if, if you like what you heard and saw here, subscribe to the channel, give me a like, tell your friends about it, bring more people to the channel and help us, you know, help you become better informed long-term investors. This is Chuck Carnival saying thanks for watching.